All right, we're back and uh, we're studying the book of Acts. We're in chapter number seven. Um, we have uh, completed chapter six, very, very brief chapter, short chapter compared to some of them, compared to this one actually, only 15 verses. But we saw the introduction of a group of men that we call today, that we call deacons. Among them, uh, there were two worthy of note. One was Philip who uh, shows up in the next chapter, in chapter number 8. And uh, the first of those was uh, uh, Stephen, who shows up here in chapter number 7. He's being confronted by uh, the uh, religious leaders. After uh, upsetting the, the synagogue of the Libertines, they called uh, the uh, elders and said, we've got a guy here who's a troublemaker. His name is Stephen. They called him in. They confronted him. And now Stephen is telling his story. He's connecting the dots of the history of the children of Israel. It goes all the way back to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and begins to tell the story. The goal is to show ultimately that Jesus Christ is a fulfillment of all of these prophecies and history, all of this stuff that has uh, taken place historically in the nation and for the nation of Israel. So we're on page 96 of our notes, God's faithfulness through Joseph. So we saw the uh, Abraham, we saw Isaac, we saw Jacob, and we saw the uh, 12, the 12 sons or patriarchs as they're called, the 12 sons of, um, of Israel or Jacob. And now we're moving on in verse number 9 of Acts 7, and the patriarchs a uh, pater means father in Latin, so a patriarch is a father. And the patriarchs moved with envy, that is the brothers of Joseph. This story begins in Genesis chapter 37. Moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now there came a dearth or a famine over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. So there was a famine, famine in Egypt, and um, uh, this was predicted if you've studied the story of Joseph. It's a great story. It starts in Genesis chapter 37 and really comprises the rest of the book of Genesis right to the end. But um, there's a dearth, there's a famine and uh, in the land, in the land of, of Israel, in the land of Canaan. And so Jacob, concern, concerned about his family, looking for some food somewhere. Verse 12, But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Uh, this is really a, a, uh, the short version, the Cliff's Notes version of the story of Joseph, for sure. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, three score, that would be 60, and 15 is 75 souls. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over to Sichem and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the son of Sichem. You can go back and read these stories earlier in the book of Genesis. So the story continues here, being told by Stephen to these uh, leaders who have uh, confronted him. Uh, what are some of the things that we uh, can pick out of this? Stephen is emphasizing God's providence and spiritual direction in Joseph's life. Again, without a temple, without a temple. Joseph is a type or a picture of Christ, probably the greatest picture of Christ. I think, I think it's Arthur Pink in his, uh, his commentary on the book of Genesis that he points out that Joseph... Uh, was a type or a symbol of Christ in about a hundred different ways. Probably the greatest picture or type of Christ in all the Bible. So he's a type of Christ. He was the envy of his brothers. 
He was rejected like Christ. Sold into slavery, Christ was rejected. Joseph became their savior of sorts, physically speaking. And Israel has a habit of rejecting their saviors. That's kind of the implication by what uh, Stephen is sharing with these religious leaders. This is uh, uh, by implication. So he continues in verse 17, and we see letter C in the middle of 97, Israel's rejection of Moses. So we've pretty much gone through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the story of Joseph in the first uh, 16 verses of chapter 7. And now we're going to pick up the story of Moses. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God, God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. Of course, the Israelites, they started out on a very, uh, with a very positive relationship with the Pharaoh because of who Joseph was, his uh, relationship with the Pharaoh at that time. But hundreds of years have passed by, and now we have a new Pharaoh. Joseph is dead. He is gone. The fathers, the patriarchs, are gone. And now we have this teeming mass of Israelites who have settled in the land of Egypt and are threatening, um, at least by their sheer numbers, the overthrow of the Egyptian pharaoh and his government. At least that's his fear, whether this was, whether this was his, just his feelings or things that happened to actually threaten him. The Bible doesn't say, to my knowledge. I don't recall anything like that. But then another king, or another pharaoh, arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers. He did not act positively, but negatively, so that they cast out their young children to the end that they might live. Of course, this is the story of Moses uh, in the early chapters of the book of Exodus. The Hebrew midwives were instructed to eliminate any of these male uh, babies as they came in to uh, control population growth so that they would not further uh, uh, increase and take over the population of Egypt, again, by their sheer numbers. <coughs> so we pick this up. In verse 20, in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. The story is found in the early chapters of the book of Exodus. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He was raised uh, with a favorable, a good upbringing in Pharaoh's family, and was mighty in words and in deeds. He was a gifted and talented individual, and obviously well-educated. And when he was full, 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God, by his hand, would deliver them, but they understood not. So Moses understands that he has an assignment. He has a purpose in his life. He is going to be the deliverer of the nation of Israel. He's going to be the one who's going to lead the Israelites from Egypt back to that promised land that was originally given to Abraham back in Genesis number Genesis chapter number 12. In verse 25 again, he supposed his brethren would have understood. Well, they didn't understand. He was uh, assuming, he was taking too much for granted. Verse 26 says, And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, your brethren... Why do you wrong one to another? So he's trying to resolve this conflict diplomatically, civilly. But he, but he that did his neighbor wrong 
thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Well, apparently, this individual didn't see the handwriting on the wall. This is where this was Moses' destiny. This was his assignment to be a ruler, to be a judge over them. Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Well, I don't think that uh, Moses thought that this was common knowledge, but apparently the fact that he had wasted this Egyptian the day before in this conflict had become common knowledge. And verse 29 tells us that then fled Moses at this saying and was a stranger in the land of Madian where he begat two sons. Now again, this is the Cliff Notes version of uh, a story that uh, encompasses several chapters in the book of Exodus. Again, at the bottom of 97, Moses is a type of Christ, as Joseph was, favored by God and miraculously preserved uh, at his birth, as Christ was, as you'll recall, reading through the Gospel of Matthew. Moses was mighty in words and deeds, and when Moses offered deliverance to his brethren, as Christ did, he was rejected as Christ was rejected. And the question was asked, who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? This is kind of the attitude, this is the attitude that the Jews had toward Jesus himself. So again, we see that uh, Stephen is telling the story, he's connecting the dots, and he says, you know, um, Moses was very, Moses and uh, the relationship that he had with the children of Israel was very similar to the relationship that Christ has or had with you. Moses was rejected as you have rejected Christ. So we pick up the story in verse number 30. And when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sion an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. Here we are, we're in uh, uh, Exodus chapter number 3, the burn story of the burning bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. He didn't dare look. He was overwhelmed. He couldn't look at this bush as a result of the announcement from that bush. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, in the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and am come down to deliver them, and now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel, which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out. After that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. So this, uh, this uh, conflict that precedes this between these two individuals, and of course, uh, um, Moses slew one, and then the question, who made you a king and a judge over us? The, the, those, the, those situations were really, in a sense, prophetical. Now we see that what, now we see what, what God was up to in preparing Moses for uh, his uh, uh, leadership to lead the children of Israel. What he knew and what he didn't, again, we're reading a very, uh, even the book of Exodus doesn't say a lot about all of this. When we talk about the burning bush, we're in Exodus chapter number three, so we've only got a couple chapters that give us information as to the early days, uh, the pre-ministry, if you please, of Moses. We just see that in a couple chapters. And then, of course, Moses becomes a key figure after that. But uh, God revealed himself to Moses in a bush. Again, 
Just by way of note, there was no temple. Wherever the voice of God speaks is holy ground, chapter 7. Moses did not need a temple to be close to God and receive direction from him. So Moses at first refused uh, to become Israel's deliverer. So these are just some of the, you know, the, the highlights of what uh, Stephen is sharing with them in verses 30 through 36. So we pick up the story, connecting the dots of the history of the nation of Israel in verse 37, page number 98. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. Now, Stephen is referencing the book of Deuteronomy, where a prophecy is given that a prophet like unto Moses would come to be the deliverer of the nation of Israel. Go back and read through. In fact, I'm, sh- I'm sure there's notes here, specific references, but I know the general uh, area that Genesis 15 and Genesis 18, those prophecies show up. This is he, verse 38, that was in the church in the wilderness. Notice the term church in the wilderness. A church is a body or a group of individuals, and we would understand that it's a group of believers. It's not the building. The church was in the wilderness, but there was no building in the wilderness. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel, which spake to him in the Mount Sinai, and with our fathers who received the lively or the living, lively oracles to give unto us. That's the Ten Commandments, more generally the law, to whom our fathers would not obey. Eh, you guys have a, you know, you're, uh, you guys have a bad track record with God, Stephen is saying. He says that, uh, you know, you didn't, uh, you didn't, uh, you didn't obey. They didn't obey. And you're not obeying right now. That's the implication of what Stephen is saying. To whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt. Oh, if we were only back in Egypt where it was warm and it was dry and there was plenty of food and all of our needs were taken care of. This trip to the promised land isn't turning out exactly the way we hoped. Saying, verse 40, unto Aaron, the people said, Make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we what not, or we know not, what has become of him. We're getting ready for the uh, golden calf in Exodus chapter number 32. That's what this is preparing us for. We what not, uh, another English word, a wit, no, a witty person. This is a form of the word wit. We what not, we don't know what has become of him. In other words, Moses went to Sinai and he's been gone for a while and the people get nervous and say, he's not coming back. We need a leader. We need to do what we think is best. And of course, what they did, verse 41 says, they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in their works of their own hands. That is, they rejoiced in the golden calf. Then God turned, verse 42, and gave them up to worship the host of heaven as it is written in the book of prophets, O ye house of Israel. This is Amos chapter 5, verse 25, that Stephen is quoting. And again, an indictment against the children of Israel. What Stephen is doing is he's telling the history of Israel, showing how rebellious they have been, and by implication, you, my audience, Stephen's present audience, you are doing the same thing that they did back then. O ye house of Israel, Amos 5. Have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch 
and the star of your God, Remphan, figures which he made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. So Amos, the minor prophet Amos, is, is referenced. And again, Stephen is pointing out the rebellion, the unbelief, the disobedience of the children of Israel historically. This is 400 and plus years, 400 and some plus years before the birth of Christ. Way before that now, because we, we see the, the promise, I'll carry you away beyond Babylon. Moses promised that God would raise up a prophet. We noted that. Moses, like Jesus, enjoyed special intimacy with God, top of page 99. But Israel rejected Moses and Jesus and turned back to Egypt. They rejoiced in the works of their own hands. The Jews were not, the leadership of Israel was not generally spiritual. They, by implication, again, they worshipped the fruit or the works of their own hands. What they did, what they accomplished. They were pretty self-satisfied in, in uh, their worship system. And essentially, they worshipped idols, the works of their own hands. That could be a building that you've built. Look at the beautiful temple that we have built. God instructed us. We have built it this is what spirituality is all about. We want people to come from around the world to come and see our building and come in and see how we go through our rites and our rituals. You'll be impressed with how spiritual we are when you see what we do and what we have to worship our God. Stephen is, by implication, saying that's not what is important. You know what's important? Obedience is important. Doing what you're told to do. Israel has a history of rebellion. And the greatest act of rebellion that Israel has ever engaged in is crucifying Jesus Christ, your Messiah. That's where this is going. And that's why by the time we get to the end of this sermon <laughs> that Stephen is, is preaching, they are not happy. The audience is not happy. They come forward, all right, at the invitation to stone the preacher. <laughs> Have you ever felt that way when you preached a message? Anyway, look with me, 99. Even as Israel rejected God, they still had the tabernacle and temple, but they still had their stuff they still had their symbols of God and their symbols of worship. Verse 44, page 99, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. You can go to the book of uh, Hebrews, and there's more on this in Hebrews about the pattern in the tabernacle. Which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him an house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? The temple, the tabernacle were only symbols or signs. There was re little reality in them. They were symbols or signs of something that was much greater. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me? Hath not my hand made all these things? I mean, the very materials, the very wisdom, intelligence that was given these individuals, the patterns that were set up, the instructions that were given to build, whether it was the building, the temple itself, the garments, 
all of the various uh, uh, um, aids to worship, if I could use them, that were part of the holy of holies and the holy place. All of these things were made out of stuff that God made. I mean, this wasn't like these men have uh, created anything. They have only taken the words of God and done what God instructed them to do with materials that God made and gave them the intelligence or the um, skill to make. So, we have some thoughts here in the middle of 99. The presence of the tabernacle of the temple did not keep them from rejecting God and his messengers. The Most High, that's the Lord, does not dwell in temples made with hands. The temple had become a place of idolatry. In fact, in Ezekiel, there's some, I think it's Ezekiel chapter 16, there's some very interesting statements about the temple and the tabernacle. They tried to confine God to the space within four walls. Maybe we do that sometimes. We leave God out of our life. And on Sundays or Wednesdays or whenever we come to church, we come to visit him and make sure that he's doing okay. We say, hello, God, how you doing? I came this week. I was there for an hour. I saw, yeah, I was there, remember. Check the box. Check the box, Lord, okay? Christians have a habit of doing the same thing. They see the church building as the house of worship when in reality, 1 Corinthians notes that the believer, ah, you are the temple. We are temples of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, God is missing from much of our lives. Why? Because we don't recognize that I am the temple, that I am the dwelling place of God, and wherever I go, God goes with me. God inspires me. God empowers me. God keeps me safe and secure. God directs me, etc. We need to live in a state of constant awareness of the presence of God in our lives. That's important. That makes a difference. Stephen directs the application of the sermon to his listeners. Well, we're getting ready for the invitation here. We're getting ready for the invitation. Ye stiff-necked, verse 51, bottom of page 99. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. Israel has a bad history, a bad record of rejecting those that God sends to spiritually deliver them. The prophets, Moses, etc., which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, verse 52 says, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it? You're rejecting the prophet that God has sent again. That prophet is the Lord Jesus Christ. You're stiff-necked. You're uncircumcised. Ye do always resist, you, present tense, my audience, as your fathers did. What did they do? They persecuted, they slew, they betrayed, they were murderers. They've not kept the word of God like you. The invitation is given, stiff-necked. Stiff-necked people. Well, is it any wonder? They were not happy. By the way, these were some of the same people. <laughs> some of the same people, maybe many of them, were the same people that had crucified Christ. We can see some um, definitions and descriptions of the phraseology, uncircumcised in hearts and ears and all that. Notice Deuteronomy chapter uh, 10 on the uh, 100th page and I looked, and behold, ye had sinned against the Lord your God, and had made you a molten calf, 
Israel has been historically, so are you today, disobedient. You have now become the betrayers and the murderers of God's prophet. You have spoken against Moses. You have spoken against God. You have spoken against the temple. You have spoken against the law. You have killed, you have murdered the Messiah. The reaction, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. They were not happy. They were violent. They came after him tooth and nail. We must rid ourselves of this person. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full, that is Stephen of the Holy Ghost, verse 55, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Eighty-eight times in the New Testament, Jesus Christ is referenced or referred to as the Son of Man. Well, the execution follows. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord. They finally were united. <laughs> and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was, and here he is. He's introduced right here in chapter 7. His name was Saul who was to become the great apostle Paul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin, reminiscent of Christ. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He fell asleep. Asleep is a euphemism for death. Some observations. Stephen's message is essentially twofold. God is no respecter of places. The Jews overemphasize the importance of the temple. Israel is guilty of what they have always been guilty of, rejecting God and his prophets. Jesus said that it is impossible for old wineskins to hold the new wine. Through Stephen, the Holy Spirit is showing how the old traditions of Judaism cannot contain the new wine of Christianity. God uses the martyrdom of Stephen to propel the church into the world. That's what's going to take place now. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, we're still in Jerusalem. <coughs> in chapter number 7, we're still in Jerusalem. we got to get going here. There is no theological reason to prevent the gospel from going to the Gentiles. We just need to get cracking. The sharp sword of the Word of God rips and tears up the sins of the people, laying open their wicked, defiled hearts and secrets of their souls. That's a great example and <clears throat> application of Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12. Well, that's chapter 7. Great brief Cliff's Notes version brief history of the nation of Israel. Stephen preached, one of the first deacons. He's a witness. Deacons are witnesses. <coughs> Pastors are witnesses. Christians are to be witnesses. And that's exactly what Stephen was doing right here. He was being a witness, and he lost his life accordingly. Good things don't necessarily immediately follow Christian obedience. Do you understand that? John the Baptist lost his head. Jesus was crucified. Stephen was stoned. History tells us that many of the apostles were persecuted and were martyred as a result, as a result of their faith in Christ. Let's take a break right now. We'll come back and pick up in the eighth chapter. <clears throat> 